Why am I going to battle? What is happening? Bitch, I don't know how to fight. That motherfucker has a cavalry. They got horses, dog. You, you crazy? Bitch, I pick fucking cantaloupes. The fuck do you mean I got to go up against a fucking dude on a horse who's been cutting heads off for months on end? Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> that was big time stressors, I think. We work too much. This is a pretty recent phenomenon, and so this fact makes us unusual historically. It puts us out of step with our ancestors. It puts us out of step with nature. For reasons that will become obvious, anthropologists in the 20th century became very interested in the evolution of work. And so to answer some of their questions, they looked back to Stone Age societies. <laughs> you said 30-year-old quote? Surely things have changed? Yeah, for the worse, dog. What the fuck do you mean? This dude is great for basic history and Roman history videos. He's never made anything political of labor or labor. It goes hard. Very excited about it. Listen, man. Listen. Our productivity has motherfucking skyrocketed, okay? Like, unimaginable gains have been made. And every step of the way, technological achievement has given us a profound opportunity to, to do less work, right? Like less total work time and get the same output, if not more than before, right? And yet, every single step of the way, whenever there's new technological improvements, instead of dialing it back a little bit and going... Hey, maybe we don't need all this fucking time in the workplace. Maybe, just maybe, we get the same pay, if not more pay, okay, adjusted to our productivity with less hours. So I have more hours to myself. There's still going to be people that work super hard on top of that, and then they get paid. Their pay scales, right? But that's not what happened. Every technological improvement that is supposed to lighten the burden of the working class has been used by capital owners as a means to instead add additional burden to the existing laborers that have not been displaced by said technological improvements. Okay? If you are able to pick five berries and bring it home at the end of the day. And then the cave lady down the street figures out, invents the bag, and now you can pick 10 berries, okay, in a much shorter period of time. Your berry output can increase with less with less time but instead of utilizing instead of utilizing uh uh more of your day picking the 10 berries and fucking off the berry factory at the at the cave has decided no nah, actually world virtually all stone age people liked to work an average of 4 to 6 hours per day they also found that most Stone Age people liked to work in bursts, with one fast day followed by how long it took to accomplish a specific task, or cook a specific meal, or walk a specific distance. But the odd thing is that when you compare all of these little markers that were used by different cultures, they were all somewhere in the ballpark of 30 minutes. It seems that in a world without clocks or phones or sundials, measuring the day in 30 minute chunks just feels good and natural to humans. Very few societies ever felt the need to break the day into smaller chunks than that. It's hard to go much deeper than that. Oh my God, I just realized that like we do that here at the Twitch stream where I serve a one minute ad break in the middle of the hour and then a three minute ad break at the top of the hour. That's crazy.
Oh my fucking god! I'm not even running an ad break right now. I'm just—it's something that I just, just literally just figured out from archaeological evidence alone. But there are other pre-capitalist and pre-industrial societies that we can look back to to help us. There are excellent surviving records from medieval Europe that delve into this issue. So let's start there. For virtually all of human history, most work has been agricultural work. Because of you, I sued my old employer with the NLRB for violating my rights for unionizing, and I won the case. Fuck yeah, certified soulless. Good shit. Congratulations. Glad the justice was served in your case. This was also true of medieval Europe. So when thinking about medieval workers, we shouldn't be thinking about cities. We should be thinking about workers in fields. For the first hour or so of the medieval workday, people would just trickle in at their own pace. The employer was usually expected to provide some food to the workers. So for this time, people usually had a chat and a bite to eat, but otherwise did nothing. As you can imagine, convincing people to get up and start the work for the day was often quite difficult. Employers complained about it all the time. <laughs> Nobody wants to work anymore. <laughs> I love that. It, it, tale as old as time itself, dude. Ever since we decided like, oh, I could put a fence around these common goods. You know, this, this property that is supposed to be for everybody. Not property, but it's just like this land that's supposed to be for everyone. I think that was probably the first day motherfuckers were like, wait a minute. You know? I can enforce these enclosures with, like, violence, okay? And then I can make motherfuckers work here, and that's when they realize, wait a minute, nobody wants to work anymore. After a couple of hours in the field, there would usually be a mid-morning break that could range from 30 to 60 minutes, where workers would have another bite to eat. When the sun was high in the sky and the day was starting to get hot, work would stop again for an extended period of time. Something like two, maybe even three hours, depending on how hot it was that day. <laughs> this period would begin with a larger midday meal that would be recognizable to us as lunch and was- Yeah, except these dudes literally, like there are people who live like this. We call them Spanish people and Italian people and Greek people, okay? They, they still do this. Those who have not been tarnished by, uh, like, American, or, or rather, like, uh, Protestant work ethic. There's different versions of it all around the world. You know what I mean? Let's follow it up by, this is not a joke, nap time. In medieval Europe, siestas weren't just a Spanish thing, they were an everywhere thing. <laughs> After returning to work, refreshed and rejuvenated, workers would intensify the pace of their work in an effort to finish everything up for the day. If they were done by the mid-afternoon, they could go home. If they weren't, they would break for another 30 to 60 minutes, with more food provided, before going back in for one last sprint. Most of the time, workers didn't have to stay much later than this. But if it was harvest season and people were working late, there would often be a larger break in the evening with a larger meal provided by the employer. But this was rare. Workers might be in the field for like eight hours a day, but when you account for all of the breaks, they would only be working for four to six of those hours. During the busy- I mean, this is pretty funny because like, we kind of do that too. It's just that, like, we literally do that. We do that in bullshit jobs, right? Like, this is, you're basically describing the most common formation of an office job. Like, that is literally it. Not even four to six hours, to be real. It's, like, probably two hours max. No, nah, you're wrong. No, this is what an office job looks like as well. East times of year, they might be in the fields for, like, 12 hours a day. But with... Except there aren't really that many breaks anymore. I feel like you don't... I love when people go, nah, that's not fucking true. And like, I've, obviously this is a Saturday, so it's different. But usually during the week when someone says that, they're watching me at work. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, people, people will be like, dude, are you kidding me? That's not how it is at all. And it's like, bro, you're literally at work right now with a fucking earbud in listening to me. Like, what, what are you saying? Like, I know what you're doing. 
The breaks, they would only be working for seven to nine of those hours. Notice the numbers we're playing with here. Stone Age peoples all over the world and agricultural workers in medieval Europe both liked to work four to six hours a day, even though each group had no knowledge or memory of each other. It seems that this is just a natural pattern that humans like. Medieval workers would work longer during the harvest or during a crisis, but they didn't like to, and that's the point. Also notice the length of these breaks. Medieval workers measured the days in 30 minute chunks, just like their Stone Age ancestors. I love when annoying neoliberals will look at this analysis and go, oh, so you think it was better in feudal times? And it's like, no, dude. No, it wasn't better. No, don't say yes, you fucking weirdos. No, you can't say yes. You can't type out yes on a fucking keyboard that was like designed in uh, America and has like minerals that they uh, extracted from Zimbabwe that was assembled in a fucking plant in China that was shipped from China to the United States of America on like same day delivery, okay? Over wires that were put many years ago by workers on, and uh, it, uh, on technology that was you know, designed around interconnectivity. You can't fucking say yes like that as though, you know, technological advancements are not, have not made your lives profoundly better. Of course it has. I say yes as I fucking, uh, you know, go on my phone, which is an unimaginable technological achievement like fucking 20 years ago, 30 years ago, to type in Uber Eats. So that like a modern peasant can fucking hand deliver me my food. Like get the fuck out of here. Obviously situation is, is uh, you know, better for everyone, including even the uh, Uber Eats guy who's driving a car, right? However, it can be much better. I don't, I don't care about like how much better uh, technology is improved because like technology will improve regardless. It's what we do with those technological improvements that matter. Okay? What else sticks out in the medieval workday? Notice how the workers were constantly eating. This was one of the perks of being a day laborer. Food was a worker's biggest expense, and so part of their compensation was that their employer would take care of the food for that day. It would be like if part of your compensation was that your boss paid your rent. It relieved a massive financial burden. One wow. Seems pretty good to me. I see no issues with this. <laughs> One other thing to note was that work was Thank God we have a similar structure nowadays. Generally understood to be a thing that happened during the day. And although there wasn't an exact science to this, a workday was broadly understood to be half of daylight hours. If there was an urgent need for people to literally work from sunrise to sunset, there was kind of a gentleman's agreement that this would count as two days of labor. What can we take away from all this? Work used to be a lot more informal and a lot more casual. Labor and leisure used to be intermingled. One was expected to relax and even nap on the job. Work was a part of a worker's life. Kicking Yeah, and when you see that, people say like, when you see that now, people like lose their fucking minds over it. This is like, you see this now and you're like, this is unimaginable. Like, what are you doing? That's fucking crazy. You can't do that. Americans lose their minds at the prospect of, like, existing in a European country where they have, like, some of this still. Obviously not to the same degree, but... Back and passing the time wasn't just something workers did at home. It was equally something they did at work. Unless there was some sort of unusual crisis, workers were not expected to experience great stress while working. Yeah, the real crisis comes when your fucking lord has decided you will now take up the spears and some weapons if you're lucky because now you're supposed to be a part of a standing army for some fucking king, okay? That's when you're cooked. You're like, what the fuck? Why am I going to battle? What is happening? 
Bitch, I don't know how to fight. That motherfucker has a cavalry. They got horses, dog. You, you crazy? Bitch, I pick fucking cantaloupes. The fuck do you mean I got to go up against a fucking dude on a horse who's been cutting heads off for months on end? Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> that was big time stressors, I think. The week always began at a leisurely pace. Monday and Tuesday as days with a holiday spirit. Employers write of their difficulty in getting people to even show up. Thursday and Friday are described as fast days. Mondays and Tuesdays were slow, Thursdays and Fridays were fast. An echo of the Stone Age pattern of working. Fast, slow, fast, slow. Saturday was payday, and so it functioned as a hurry up and finish everything so that we can get the hell out of here. <coughs> It seems that under normal circumstances, Saturday was kind of a half day, although during busy seasons it could easily turn into another fast day, like Thursday and Friday. After the week's work was done and everybody got paid, workers got a full day off on Sunday. But by the 16th and 17th centuries, a new custom invented by workers disrupted this pattern. They called it Saint Monday. Saint Monday was kind of an unofficial holiday, where absenteeism was permitted and even expected on the first day of the work week. People were still flush with cash. Most feudal societies were a constitutional anarcho-syndicalist commune? That is fucking insane. Okay? There is no anarchism, and there is no syndicalism, because there is no, like, what? Bro, that's insane. What? No, that's not true. What? Bro, I'm begging. Oh, fuck, man. No, you're joking, right? Please. Either you're joking or you are an anarchist who is who has the largest refusal, who has shown the greatest demonstration of the refusal to read. Or is that a joke? <laughs> it's a Monty Python bit? Oh, okay. <laughs> I love my I love my anarcho feudalism, which is feudalism and I don't have to take a shower. It's the best of both worlds. There's like abject tyranny, okay? In the form of feudal lordships <laughs> and monarchs, okay, who can just like fuck my wife on the night of my uh, wedding, okay? Why? Because they said so. And I can't really do anything because the only thing I know how to do is use a fucking pitchfork, okay? And they got all the knives and shit. <laughs> Love that. That's my favorite type of anarcho syndicalist formation. Let's keep going. Ash from last Saturday. And Monday was a slow day anyways. So it just organically became a thing that workers just didn't show up. Employers learned to tolerate it and workers gleefully looked forward to it. Countless labor actions in early modern Europe can be traced back to some dumbass boss with something to prove, trying to crack down on their beloved St. Monday. This was the real origin of the two-day weekend. It didn't come from government. It came from workers. They just did it themselves. And it came centuries before any legislature got around to making it official. I feel like a lack of centralization also allowed... I'm not, I'm not an anarchist by any means. I want to qualify this. I want to clarify something here. I am not an anarchist. I would like to point that out okay i'm not I, I took a shower earlier today i'm not an anarchist however at least when looking at this and analyzing it from the material realities uh, uh analyzing it for the framework of historical materialism it certainly does feel as though a lack of centralization did inevitably give workers more power 
because they could just kind of do whatever the fuck they wanted to, and you had no mechanism of, of, you know, forcing them to do what you wanted to do. Obviously, there was the food uh, incentive, but that is an incentive. It was not the, the negative reinforcement of, you know, just saying like, okay, well, you're fucked. You have no job. Everyone could just kind of be like, okay, well, all right. We're just not showing up on Monday, you know? How it worked. Because people, it seems, were, you know, more, more aware of what they wanted to do. Centralization goes both ways, basically pro-worker or pro-boss, yes. But leaving aside St. Monday, it's striking how different the mentality of medieval workers was from the mentality of workers today. Or let's flip that around. It's striking how different our mentality is today from that of our ancestors, going back hundreds, even thousands of years. Here's one specific example of that difference. Whenever medieval workers could afford to stop working, they did. Medieval Europe was not a culture in which people saved a lot of money. This isn't because they were primitive or selfish or anything like that. There just wasn't that much for poor people to spend their money on. Food, housing, clothing, that was pretty much it. If a worker was all set in those three categories, there honestly wasn't that much else available to them. This led to a phenomenon in medieval Europe, where, after all of a worker's basic needs were met, the more they earned, the less they worked. To put it another way, medieval workers liked to spend most of their discretionary income on leisure. This isn't such a- Yeah, well, that's crazy. They didn't have Sigma Grindset and podcasts yet, I think, to, to focus on passive income. <laughs> Yeah, Big L. Big L for those fucking dumbass peasants, dog. Big L. They were not aware of how to be the Sigma, okay? What you're supposed to do is, is immediately try to set up a drop shipping. Oh, my God. That is like a Monty Python sketch, dude. Medieval peasants learn drop shipping, but, with, but within, the, within the confines of, of that era. <laughs> I'm doing passive income. <laughs> Such a strange phenomenon. If you survey people today and offer them a choice between more money and more time off, most people. It's called. It's called the crop market. <laughs> Where I'm telling you that other fucking serfdom is seemingly yielding way more crops year over year. And I've done it. I've done the analysis. It seems like I should take some of this gold, some of these coins, and give it to those guys because they're doing more crop yield. This is how it's supposed to work. <laughs> Would take more time. Yeah. It's the Arabs that came up with it. They're calling it mathematics. I don't know why I sound like Russell Brand. Yeah. <laughs> it's like numbers, yeah? It's, it's mental, innit? It's maths. Mathematics. Short for maths, yeah? I'm off. It's just that under our system, people are never offered that choice. Or when they try to exercise that choice for themselves, they are either professionally punished or fired. In medieval Europe, people could make that choice for themselves. And whenever possible, workers worked less. A lot less. Yeah, nobody wants to work anymore. A tale as old as time itself. There were you three guys major have, holidays. You guys have seen that uh, that one guy on on Twitter who like um, analyzed the nobody wants to work anymore keyword from like like early newspapers. I think it's like it, it spans back to like the 17th or 18th century or something or 18th century onwards. Like like any time there was anything that was written down, like I feel like you could find tablets, dude. You could go back in time and fucking it, on the hieroglyphs, you got motherfuckers complaining about nobody wants to work anymore. You know what I mean? 
day periods, where workers routinely took a big chunk of time off. Easter, Midsummer, and Christmas. Or for the uninitiated, March or April, late June, and late December. I would note that of the three, only the December Nobody wants to work anymore? Meme cites real newspaper articles? Oh yeah, this is it. We looked into origin, origins of clippings from 14 articles that were published between 1894 and 2022, most of which we found from newspaper archives. Yeah. This is, my, this is one of my favorite threads, dude. Obviously, like, here, the 2022 stuff you've already seen, so that's, like, not as fun. But <laughs> here you go. 1894. With all the mines of the country shot down by strikers, what will the poor editor do for coal next winter? It is becoming apparent that nobody wants to work these hard times. In 1905, labor is scarce, high and very unreliable. None want to work for wages. 1916, nobody wants to work. What about vegetables? Hasn't it been a good year for vegetables, the dealer was asked. Well, as near as I can find out, he answered, the reason for food scarcity is that nobody wants to work as hard as they used to. I asked a man who was in here the other day why he didn't raise more livestock and make his own butter. Women don't want to make butter anymore, he said. And then he asked, do you know where prices would go if we raised more calves and peaks and made more butter? They would go way down. <laughs> 1922. What is the cause of unemployment in hard times? The manufacturing businessmen say it is because nobody wants to work anymore unless they can be paid enough wages to work half of the time and loaf half of the time. The working man says, well, we don't care about what the working man says. Orchardists complain of the shortage of labor in 1937. Faced with the shortage of labor when unemployment is widespread, peach orchardists in York and Adams counties are complaining that nobody wants to work anymore. There is work, it is reported, for 15 to 25 peach pickers in every orchard in the two counties, but only two to five pickers are at work because of the unavailability, unavailability of labor. Nobody, it seems, wants to work at the peach or apple picking and packing, an Adams County fruit grower declared. One of the oldest writings we have is a negative review of a copper salesman. No. No shot. Written in Akkadian Kune form, it is considered to be the oldest known written complaint. The content. The tablet details that A. Nasher traveled to Dilmun to buy copper and return to sell it in Mesopotamia. On one particular occasion, he had agreed to sell copper ingots to Nani. Nani sent his servant, to the money, uh, servant with the money to complete the transaction. The copper was considered by Nani to be substandard and was not accepted. In response... Nani created the cuneiform letter to deliver to Enashir, inscribed in it as a complaint to Enashir about the copper delivery of the incorrect grade and the issues with another delivery. Nani also complained that his servant, who handled the transaction, had been treated rudely. He stated that at the time of the writing, he had not accepted the copper, but had paid money for it. Okay, this is literally a negative review on an eBay salesman, I think. This is like... It's not exactly like a worker's complaint. But it's funny that since we fucking put, since we decided to write shit down, we've just been complaining about commerce. That's sick. I wonder if there are better, I wonder if there are better like direct complaints about I guess that like you can find, I, there's gotta be like hieroglyphs of of like, like slaves in Egypt, you know what I mean? And like the slave runners complaining that the slaves don't want to work hard or some shit. Like there has to be, right? Man, these fucking slaves are so lazy, like that type of thing. XCC and Jor, I don't know, man, it sounds weird. Ian Nasser got, got over 100 complaints about bronze quality and kept all of them at his home. Well, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's, it's a pretty effective way of, uh, of, of destroying the complaints because how else are, how else are people going to find out? <laughs> it's not that easy to write shit back then, right? <laughs> so he just kept them.
<laughs> he basically deleted the reviews. It's not like they were writing stuff down to like show it to other people, uh, you know? <laughs> Holiday period made it into the modern era intact. Things really slowed down in the winter. Days were short and the work was short. Because of this, a tradition evolved called winter wages, where workers were paid half a day's wage. Wait, 3,200 year old Egyptian tablets shows they took attendance at work and recorded absentees? Calling in sick to work is apparently an ancient tradition? Whether it's the sniffles or a scorpion bite, some days you just can't make it. As it turns out, ancient Egyptian employers kept track of employee days off in registers written on tablets. Also, why the fuck are all these tablets in the British Museum, I wonder? Hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. It's so cool how they all voluntarily made it their way to the, to the British Museum. <laughs> Wasn't there a theft at the British Museum recently? Brother, you cannot steal from the British Museum, okay? It's only, probably you can reclaim stuff, but I don't think you can steal it because it's not yours, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's most likely a reclamation. One of my favorite examples of this is the Chinese uh, stealing back by way of like uh by way of like sending highly skilled thieves to to steal back uh, some of their what ornaments or their their china yeah it, it's fire it's a very cool story have you seen the belgian girl picking stones on the beach in antaya which turned out to be relics yeah um i heard this story from my mom and um she was very upset at the coverage of this story in European news where they apparently made it seem like she just randomly happened across ancient relics. For smuggling historical value of stones confirmed. Belgian couple returned from holiday in Turkey was detained last week after customs officials found three stones in their suitcase. A report by, a report by local experts now showed that the stones do have a historical or archaeological value, though the couple said they had no idea. How'd they fucking find these stones? In the meantime, the Provincial Directorate of Culture and Tourism of Antalya has had the three stones in the Belgian suitcase examined by experts in the Antalya Museum. The report was made public a few days ago, the Turkish media reports. The stones with the two stylized rosettes on it was an architectural decoration piece, and the two marble pieces were floor-covering pieces the experts concluded, meaning it was indeed forbidden due to their nature to take them out of the country. Turkey's law on the protection of cultural and natural resources is strict for those who try to smuggle objects with possible archaeological value out of the country. The Belgian Foreign Affairs Ministry warns on his website that it is strictly prohibited to export antiquities, minerals, or objects found on site, stones for example, even if they do not show any cultural historical value from Turkey. We often take them as decoration for my aquarium, she said. See, that's like, dude, the European mind cannot stop, okay? This is, listen, it's in, it's in the Belgian's nature, okay? Do you, this is going to make for a banger YouTube essay from, like, the likes of Lemino or something, you know what I mean? Like, or like a Wendigoon video <laughs> 10 years from now. All right, let's get back to this one YouTube essay that we were watching, though. For half a day's work. We're talking about a four-hour workday, at the very most. If you add in all the breaks, this would be maybe two to three hours of actual work. Winter wages were usually done for the months of December and January, and during this time, people took as much time off as they could afford. Workers spent their extra time on indoor labor that might not generate a profit. Home repairs, building new furniture, patching up or making new clothing, these were jobs best saved for the slow winter months. When you total up the estimated number of days worked by medieval farm laborers, things become quite stark. Researchers have found that Spanish farm laborers did not work for 42% of days in a year. In France, the number was more like 49%. 
the English usually worked more. But this wasn't because they were naturally more industrious, it's because they were historically more exploited by their aristocracy. When they're That's where the cuckening begins, dude. The angloid mind was formed from the jump, shaped to be servile, okay? That's that's where this that's where this entire process begins. You know, I talk about like Americans are uniquely cucked, and everyone always chimes in. And they're like, "Well, what about the British?" It's like, yeah, yeah. What about the British? Exactly. Epigenetic memory of fucking being servile. It's just no matter what happens, no matter what the fuck happens, my lordship will be served. There was a labor shortage in the 14th century. English laborers immediately used their clout to create more time off for themselves. For a time, English workers enjoyed 51% of days free from work. The funny thing about these numbers, 42%, 49%, rare 51%, English, rare Anglo -W. almost every oh, echo how people 49%, 51% is that once again, they echo how people worked in Stone Age societies. Almost every other day off. Fast, slow, fast, slow. Labor historian E.P. Thompson describes this work pattern as a natural human rhythm and a common preference in people across different regions, different cultures, and different times. I think this is also why, like, early speculations on the future of labor almost always revolved around, like, workers naturally getting more time off rather than less. Like, many, nobody was like, oh, in the future, we're going to be working way harder, actually, with technological improvements. You know what I mean? Because, like, every single person was like, why the fuck would you work harder? Like, everybody wants, everybody wants less work, right? Like, naturally, that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, like, uh, what? Two days on, five days off, there's your poster. The 40-hour work week being the standard that things are based off of is inherently evil. That was also clawed back. Because it was worse than that, and then people died to make it that. You understand? <laughs> that was literally won by fighting and dying so that that could happen. Okay? Weekends. Also, a hard-fought battle. Crazy that we're literally on the cusp of full implementation of AI and the work days barely being talked about being reduced to four days a week because everyone understands that when AI kicks in, you're just going to work harder because now you're going to be doing four people's jobs, okay? And the other three people that were working alongside you are going to get fucking fired because that's how it works under capitalism. Like, when efficiency goes up, that, that means we can eliminate redundancies, Everybody understands that. That's why people are so fearful of the top of the hour ad break. Because everybody understands that at the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. And they're like, fuck, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. But fear not. The wise man says you no longer need to see those ads at the top of the hour by subscribing for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime. Or by getting gifted a... Su <laughs> Here's the three-minute ad break now. Times. For a point of comparison, consider a modern worker working five days a week. In a calendar year, that worker has 28% of days off. Add in the 10 or so public holidays that most countries have, and that worker now has 31% of days off. Add in two weeks of vacation, and that worker now has 34% of days off. Assume instead that they get six weeks of vacation, and that worker has 39% of days off. In order for a modern worker to even begin to rival the amount of time off enjoyed by a medieval French farm laborer, that modern worker would need to be provided with 3.5 months of vacation per year, plus weekends, plus public holidays. Medieval this is before you factor in 
technological improvements. Okay? Your fans are toxic as fuck, man. Wait, what? Why? We're having fun watching this. Your fans? Bitch, you're my fan. You're a 13 month subscriber. <laughs> what? He's like, not me, though. <laughs> your fans. Is true? What happened? You're you're the fan. <laughs> I'm dumb. Wait, what happened though? Why are they toxic? I can't tell if he's saying he's toxic or something. Like I don't know what's happening here. I paid for a message, but nothing sones. I feel like an idiot and five dollars poorer. Keg W. Fuck you, man. I'm fucking mad. I don't even know where you paid. Is it fruit snack zero zero that said, can I please get on ban? Chef Jone donated $5 said, I like you, but you have some takes I don't like, and that's okay. That's it. I've gotten two TTSs in like the past three hours because, you know, there's no TTS. What happened, Smidal? It is what it is. I'm fucking drunk. Oh, my God. It's always a drunk chatter, dude. Dude, drinking and driving, very cool. Drinking and chatting, not cool, okay? Stop it. Do not drink and chat. You will come across like a douchebag, and the saddest part is it's, like, on your permanent record, and then people always use it against you. Anyway, let's continue. Drink and watch. I'm not saying don't drink. But just, you know, don't drink and chat. Evil workers were operating on a level so far beyond us that it's difficult to even dream that big. Oh, the point I was going to make before that guy started saying your fans are toxic, even though he is a fan himself. Um, this... Also, is like, from an output perspective, like, you're talking about a medieval peasant, right? Like, the amount of crops that they're able to cultivate is so much more limited due to the lack of technological advancements in comparison to, like, what you can do now, right? So, even if, so if we're also talking about productivity... Like, this is a simple comparison of, like, how many days off you get as a medieval peasant. Okay? This doesn't even look at, this doesn't even factor in, and I'm sure this guy probably will later down the line. This doesn't even fucking factor in uh, the, the uh, output side, like the productivity side. Because now, it's not even necessarily three and a half months of vacation now you could probably get the same level of output, okay, with like literally a, a tenth of the amount of labor that you're putting in. To be fair, one thing to keep in mind is that the medieval figures were days were day off wage labor, but does not include the other types of necessary labor like repairs and taking care of livestock that we no longer need to worry about. Medieval workers were operating on a level so far beyond us that it's difficult to even dream that big. Up until the modern era, workers were paid by the day. The length of the workday could fluctuate throughout the year. But even during the busiest periods, workers might be in the fields for 12 hours at most. But as I've said, if you take into account all of the breaks and meal times and nap times, that might translate into eight hours of actual work. And that was on the busy end of the spectrum. At other times, a shortened workday would often lead to less than four hours of actual work. That all began to change with the proliferation of mechanical clocks. Cities and towns began building clock towers in their town squares in the late uh -oh. 14th and early 15th century. The oppressive construct of time and time management. Things are beginning to take a turn for the worse, Chad. And before too long, churches and yes, even some private businesses were inspired to have mechanical clocks of their own. 
arguably the most important clock ever built, was installed at the Amsterdam Stock Exchange in 1611. The Netherlands were at the epicenter of this new capitalism fad that was sweeping Europe, and their shiny new stock exchange reflected that. Local Dutch governments tried to curb the capitalist fervor taking over their country by this video is describing things so out of order. What's your issue with it? Restricting stock trading to certain times of day, two hours in the summer and 30 minutes in the winter. Wait a second. See that? Even as late as 1611, Dutch stock traders had their own version of winter wages. It didn't even necessarily make sense for their job. It was just in the culture that that's what people did in the winter. Anyways, the Dutch wanted to issue hefty fines to any traders who violated these restrictions. So the stock exchange commissioned a giant state-of-the-art clock. This idea quickly proliferated to every stock exchange in Europe. And with this, the clock escaped the public realm of town squares and entered the private realm of business. All of a sudden, Capitalists wanted to prove how much of a capitalist they were by having their place of business install a mechanical clock, just like their local stock exchange. Clock mania had begun. Textile mills were the first businesses utterly transformed by the clock. Some brain genius had the idea to connect the mechanical clock to a bell, which would signal the beginning and the end of the workday. This was a profound cultural shift, and workers really struggled to make sense of it. Understandably, under the old system, and by the old system I mean the way that people have been working for all of human history, workers were hired by the day and measured the day in 30 minute chunks. They began and ended their work day accordingly, within a broad 30 minute window. Now workers were hired by the hour and measured the day in 60 second chunks. This was new and it was confusing. Many workers responded to the workday bell by doing the most logical thing under the circumstances. They just ignored it. It had never mattered before at precisely what minute one began or ended their work. So why should it matter now? But the capitalists cared. In fact, they would develop an unhealthy obsession with the clock. Before too long, the capitalists were able to convince city governments to get involved, who began issuing fines to workers who were late for the workday bell. Let me say this again. If a worker who worked for a private business was one minute late for work, the local government would fine them as much as an entire day's pay. This kind of thing had never been done before. It had never been part of the unwritten contract between bosses and workers. The capitalists just invented this new rule out of whole cloth, and they did it by joining hands with local governments across Europe. In I feel like uh, this, is the, this is the change. This is around the time of like a bourgeois revolution changing the prior formation from a top-down approach to what seemingly was more egalitarian, which was uh, those who were able to accumulate some level of capital actually being able to control uh, the, the, or at least have a say in the, uh, in the formation of a government and the inherently violent acts that this government could enact upon the entire population. Uh, comprise the workers for the most part. So it basically moves from monarchs and, and feudal lords uh, having complete ownership over uh, serfs, uh, peasants, to, to, uh, to, to capital owners controlling uh, the mechanisms of power or influencing it and building it and solidifying it. industrial capitalism, and the heavy hand of government. Friends since the very beginning. The owners of the textile mills wanted to change the culture of work. And yes, and for the record, now you're just yapping. No, this was a still more 
Uh, this was a still more egalitarian formation in comparison to, you know, the prima nocta style. Uh, I do whatever the fuck I want. And you're uh, basically one step above a slave or sometimes literally an indentured servant. So technically this was better. Prima nocta is a myth of why I'm just using prima nocta as a, is, you know, the, the, the ultimate power you can have over fucking, uh, it doesn't matter. It, Prima Nocta is just a symbol of what I mean. I don't know if it was real or not. It doesn't matter if it was real. What matters is they could still cut your fucking hand off or even your head off. You know what I mean? Or force you to pick up arms and go fight. <laughs> it's real. You literally do Prima Nocta every day to our mothers. Why are you getting, are you... Are you getting married to your virgin mom? They did, but they did it by basically beating their workers into submission. As capitalism and later industrialization swept across Europe, it brought with it an oppressive, even authoritarian relationship between workers and owners. Shortly after the introduction it's of true. the clock, the capitalist class killed the customary afternoon nap that had been part of the workday for- Yeah, dude, you gotta fucking delete. Listen, man, that's inefficient, dog. That's inefficient, you know what I mean? You'll say, hey, get back to work. <laughs> as long as people could remember. Absolutely tragic. They also stopped providing food to the workers, which dumped an extra financial burden onto the working class. Meal times, which up until now had been long and informal and subsidized by the employer, were shortened and regulated down to the minute. The entire workday- From the eyes of the nascent bourgeoisie, it was definitely a positive revolution against the royalists. Looks like he's in the 1700s now. Yes. It was just squeezed and squeezed until all of the- air it was birthright shit. Your position or trade was determined by where you were born or who your parents are. Yeah, which is very different than now, which is why when I am born in the United States of America, I'm infinitely uh, more uh, uh, not lucky. OK, I'm I'm working extra hard, much harder than a child born in Rwanda, um, because that's how it works. And, and that's totally different. I mean, this is, a, this is a comparison I make quite frequently under theocratic monarchies. Obviously, it was the divine right of kings to, to have all of the land and all of the power. It was their birthright, and the justification for that came from God, right? And now, uh, under liberal democracies, under a capitalist formation, the, uh, the myth of meritocracy is the religion that keeps this entire system alive. You reinforce the notion that there is a meritocratic process and therefore you believe that like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk deserve the power of gods and kings. That's it. So going back to the Monty Python sketch, it's like replace the lady and the like with the Excalibur with uh, fucking... Uh, he worked very hard. He worked very hard and very long hours, and that's why he deserves it, and you can too. The myth of meritocracy accompanied by the American dream or the dream of prosperity, upward social mobility, just, just enough people being able to move from one social class to the next. Obviously, uh, this is not uh, a, a Marxist perspective either. I'm sorry, like when I'm talking about social mobility, I'm not talking from... Uh, from labor to bourgeois, I'm talking, uh, I'm talking like upper middle class, like the the birth of different social classes or different economic classes that was, in many respects, uh, a, a way to dilute uh, the the uh, Marxist perspectives that were developing, uh, materialist perspectives that were developing between, uh, or the dialectical perspectives developing uh, amongst the the working class. Um, you know, I can do it too. This guy, he made it from nothing. He made it from nothing and I can too. And one day I'll make it and I can also be uh, that wealthy. 
And now we've um, we've taken it one step further where there's ownership in the stock market. So everyone's wages are like in some way um, directly. Everyone is tied to capital accumulation. Um, everyone is tied to capital accumulation in some way. So they think that they the stock market has to constantly go up because it, it feels like you're... you're your retirement is going up. And in some ways it is, right? Anyway, Air and weird. all of the culture and all of the joy was taken out of it. But soon, even having a maximally productive workday wasn't enough. Workers quickly figured out that they could not trust the company clock. Many bosses liked to fiddle with the time so that the workday started a little bit too early and ended a little bit too late. One trick that bosses liked to pull with early company clocks was to rig them to the production line so that if there was any sort of technological problem, as there often was, then the clock would stop. Later generations of company clocks had mechanisms built into them that caused them to periodically pause during the workday, accumulating minutes, only to suddenly jump forward to the real time during breaks. It's funny, because the capitalists were the ones that invented this idea that the clock must reign supreme. They were the ones who had the government fine people if they were one minute late for work. They were the ones who unilaterally imposed this new social contract on workers. And then they were the ones to immediately break Dude, this is such a sick video, holy shit. This new social contract. Why? No reason, really. Just for a few extra bucks. Like I said, workers... Listen, gains made in the margins accumulate over time. Okay? <clears throat> Not for the wage laborer, who then spends its, uh, spends all of the meager wages that it earns on, obviously, subsistence and whatever remains on leisure. But gains made, made in the margins for the capital owner go directly back into new mechanisms like uh, the, the clock thing that he's describing or uh, paying for the police force or some kind of like uh, paramilitary formation to enforce uh, those rules. Caught on pretty quickly. But when workers talked with other workers... I didn't say gains made in the margins accumulate all the time. I said accumulate over time. And then... Those little gains that you make in the margins, like, you know, uh, the, the work day being a little bit shorter, I mean, a little bit longer in the beginning and in the end, ultimately yield a tremendous amount of benefits for the capital owner, the bosses, um, that they can use to develop what you know as contemporary society. About how the company clock was inaccurate, it became standard practice within the textile industry to fire them on the spot. Oh, they're questioning gulag time? Dude, you basically described uh, what a lot of people perceive as like uh, 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 of like how ruthless of an authoritarian I am when it's simply just like someone didn't understand what I was saying and they wrote it in the chat. I corrected them, didn't ban them at all, but you fantasize about me like uh, ruling the chat in an iron fist. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then you had to do it in like a very asinine like really smarmy way like uh-oh questioning gulag time really that's you did that you're the free thinker here you know what i mean fast forward 200 years when pocket watches became common workers did the sensible thing and brought them to work why wouldn't they the capitalists had established long ago that being even one minute late for work was a mortal sin Surely pocket watches would enable workers to be supernaturally punctual. This was exactly what the bosses wanted, right? But that's not how it went. For the first time ever, workers with pocket watches had physical proof that their bosses were tampering with the clocks. This practice was so egregious and so morally wrong that it became a political scandal, particularly in Britain, with genuine calls for regulation and reform. The capitalists responded to this scandal by, well, what do you think they did? Imagine, you own a factory, you find out your middle managers are messing with the company clock, 
Word gets out, there are angry newspaper columns, there are debates in parliament, there's the threat of legislation coming down on your head, there is a full-blown political scandal. What do you do? If you said, ban pocket watches from factories, search workers before they enter the building, and fire anybody who complains about it, then congratulations, you're a fascist. And yeah, that's exactly what the capitalists did. <laughs> also remember, now it's a given. Like, remember, at this point in time, it's a given that food is not supplied by the boss, Nap time is gone. Afternoon nap time is gone. And on top of that, they're fucking... Uh, and on top of that, they're adding additional uh, work hours to the clock that you're not even getting paid for. Okay? So all of those non-work hours uh, at work that you previously would be paid for uh, because you are at work and all the additional uh, money spent on you, the worker, to be a productive worker, which makes sense. Okay? is not being spent on you and you didn't even make the incremental you didn't even claw back uh any of those other amenities that were given to you from the start okay you're simply fighting for fighting for fairness to ensure that your concept of time is the same as what they have created to begin with right it's not like they were understandably pushing for nap time at work again or uh, lower work hours. They're just simply saying like, no, make this fair. And even then, this is the retaliation. But even in that retaliation, even if they were to make gains, right? Even if they were to normalize and streamline the process of like making sure that there's fairness in the uh, making sure that there's fairness in the fucking uh, in the clocks at work. There's still a tremendous amount of, uh, there's a still a tremendous amount of uh, rollbacks that you're not even paying attention to that fucked you already. But the bosses don't even want you to claw back a little bit of that because that gives you confidence, that gives you a feeling of of collective action working, and you can't have that. Have even a little bit of revolutionary spirit instilled in you because that little. That little flame can turn into a, a massive forest fire. By now, it should be clear that the mechanical clock was a tool used by the industrialists. The guy I gave a day off was schizo posting. Stop trying to fucking regulate all the people that I, uh, you know, um, you know uh, do moderation over. To subjugate and exploit their workers. It was never about productivity or efficiency, because they proved over hundreds of years that they would rather fire a productive worker than run an accurate company clock. That was where their priorities were. It was never really about profits, was it? It was about power. Uh, wait, what? Now I'm buying cream of Britishan. What does capitalism have to do with fascism, a smart guy? Fascism and capitalism has nothing to do in common. Don't lie to us like this. No, I think that person is joking. Chatter who responded to that. 20th century Canadian socialist, George Woodcock. God damn, dude. Look at the fucking bushy ass brows. Holy wrote shit. Wrote at length about what he called the tyranny of the clock. Wrote the following. And because without some means of exact timekeeping, industrial capitalism could never have developed and could not continue to exploit their workers, the clock represents an element of mechanical tyranny in the lives of modern men, more potent than any other exploiter or any other machine. All of the trends that began with the mechanical clock kicked into overdrive with the widespread adoption of artificial lighting. This is what finally killed winter wages. Now, there was no need to take it easy when the days were short. With artificial lighting, capitalists started treating every season like it was harvest season. That's how factory workers got stuck working 12, 14, 16 hour shifts, not just during the busy season, but all year long. That familiar feeling where you leave work in the winter and it's already dark out, 
That wasn't a thing until like 1802. That was a thing that was invented by industrial capitalists in order to maximize productivity. The industrial capitalists did not stop with the tyranny of the mechanical clock, and they did not stop with the 12, 14. You say, I don't know how our, the fuck our ancestors let that shit slide. Brother, think about how, try to think about how this happens right now. Like, for example, the company that you work for, especially in this tumultuous time when interest rates keep going up steadily and there isn't free money to, to, to basic, basically expand your company, you're going to experience layoffs, okay? Many companies have. And when you are experiencing that layoff, your workload increases. You see the, uh, the person to the left of you, to the right of you, maybe some of them get fired. All of a sudden, you're tasked with a lot of the workload that they were uh, taking on. And now you're more fearful of your job security than you were prior. And now you're more motivated through, uh, obviously, negative reinforcement to work as hard as possible. This is all done gradually in a way that you don't realize. We can look back at it from the future. Okay? We can look back at it from the future and go, damn, how the fuck did they not notice that? But the reality is it keeps sliding. It hasn't stopped. We're letting it slide right now. If anything... People used to actually fucking fight back more, I would say, even. When the, the uh, assembly line and the mechanisms of production were as mechanical as they were back then, it was infinitely easier to recognize your class position. It's not an accident that I think labor organizing in specific sectors is much harder now than it once was, okay? Manufacturing jobs and facilities are perfectly, uh, they're, they're perfectly designed to recognize the cruelty of the machine and, uh, and, and you know, create a perfect environment for collective bargaining and unionization. One way to stop that from happening, okay, other than like the external, the externalities, the, the, the capitalism dogma, Red Scare, McCarthyism, the Cold War, all this shit. Other than all of that stuff, one way to combat that when you have a natural, when you have a, a, a natural place of work that is so susceptible to labor unionization is, uh, is to fire a bunch of employees and rehire new ones. Now, the poultry facility does this by hiring undocumented immigrants. The Amazon distribution facilities do this by just simply hiring new workers and giving you a, a uh, extra compensation in an effort to, to stop you to, uh, to get you to stop working at the distribution facility. Amazon actually has done this so successfully for so long that they literally are going to run out of people that haven't worked in a fucking facility. Because Amazon and its delivery uh, machine has to exist everywhere, right? It has to exist everywhere. You can't, like, have a distribution facility in, in Arkansas and then operate from Arkansas. You have to have one in every fucking state, right? You have to have one pretty much everywhere. And once you get to that point, if you turn over so much, you're not going to have anything else to fucking turn over. That is yet another aspect of, yes, you are correct, capitalism being a self-consuming beast. Not to be the lol, just read Capital Guy, but this was literally Chapter 1, uh, uh, Capital Volume 1. This video does a really good job of breaking a lot of this down. Teen or even 16-hour workday. In time, they expanded their reign of terror to target public holidays. Within a matter of decades, public holidays that had existed for hundreds of years were systematically suppressed in favor of more work. I did data announce that Amazon warehouses for a few years. Turnover for our building was 67% every year. 
Yeah, you're going to run out of fucking people. At that rate, you're going to run out of people. I know that there is like an endless amount of people technically. Okay. But yeah, you're going to inevitably run out of people and you have to have a facility there. So what are you going to do? You have to have a facility there. You have to have a facility everywhere. What are you supposed to do? Because if you keep every single employee on the job, year over year, they develop experience. And if their job is menial, okay, if their task is simply take shit off shelves, put it into other shelves, and the like, which, by the way, menial labor does not mean that this is, like, labor that should be paid less, for the record, because I do not value labor over its replaceability. I value labor as a leftist over its its uh, value that it generates, okay? Yes, I value labor over its utility. If you have people working in the facilities every single fucking year, by the third year, you're like, hold up. I don't want to fucking be timed when I'm taking a piss in a goddamn stadium-sized facility where the bathroom is like 12 minutes walking distance away. And like every single step I take is being tracked by some fucking HR guy. By a robot. I don't want that. Let's fucking stop that. That's dehumanizing. That's cruel. That's uniquely unusual. That's awful. Let's do something about this. And that's how you get that revolutionary fervor, that spirit, okay? And in an effort to combat that, Amazon will give you money to leave after a couple years. This is also true. You'd be shocked to find out. You're like, what? I'm, I'm so confused. Like, you, you mean to tell me that, like, after two years in an Amazon distribution facility, they give you money to leave? What the fuck? That makes no sense. Why are they paying you to leave? Why are they incentivizing you to leave? There's two different ways that they're incentivizing it. By making the work conditions shit. So shitty that you uh, engage in this backbreaking labor. And then inevitably you're like, well, I don't want to break my back no more. Okay. And then on the other side, even if you are able to withstand the backbreaking labor... I had to take a warehouse job because of the WGA SAG strike and it was literally the worst. No HR, just a temp agency handling things in the bathroom. It was a five-minute walk away from the work area. I work for the local teams via international paper and the only time unsafe situations are given attention to is when a 70-year-old man let go of the vacuum lift to grab the product and it hit him in the face. Wait, is that the one where the facility where the guy died and then they just like put, like the managers put bags over him and then they continued to work until the, the, uh, the, the emergency vehicle came and, and carried him away lack of respect outcry over amazon employees death on warehouse floor this was on january 9th on monday on a monday january 9th 2023 work carried on as usual in the facility as workers were not informed of colleagues death even as the body lay on the floor on the morning of 27th of december 2022 at the Amazon Den Four Warehouse in Colorado Springs, Colorado, 61-year-old Rick Jacobs died on the job after experiencing a cardiac event right before a shift change. What happens next angered his former colleagues. Witnesses say a makeshift barrier around the deceased worker using large cardboard bins was used to block off the area on the outbound shipping dock where the incident occurred, and workers criticized the response and lack of transparency about the incident. Amazon denied boxes were used to cordon off the area, but said managers stood around to make sure no one came near for privacy and security. As workers arrived for their day shift, they say they were not notified about what was going on and continued working as usual while deceased colleague remained in the facility and emergency respondents, responders awaited in the ar arrival of a coroner. Finding out what had happened after walking through there had made me feel very uncomfortable as there's a blatant disregard of human emotions of this facility. Management could not have released, could have released those employees affected by offering voluntary time off so that they did not need to use their own time. But nope, that did not happen, said an Amazon employee at the warehouse who works the day shift. They requested to remain anonymous for fear of retaliation. This is the wealthiest nation on earth, mind you, in the United States of America, you know? 
when I describe the grueling workplace conditions, I'm not I'm not describing to you like some fucking 18th century factory floor. Okay? I'm talking about 2023 United States of America. Yeah. And Amazon is one of the wealthiest fucking co- like country level wealth. We talked earlier about the late medieval period when workers were able to live lives where they had 42%, 49%, 51% of days off. Only two or three hundred years later, workers had to learn to survive with only 15% of days off. The industrial capitalists would have taken more if they could, but the church mounted a defense of Sunday as a day off. Mostly. Huh. At the end of it all, the lives of workers had been completely transformed. English workers in the 19th century were working 80% more than English workers in the 17th century. The country had never been richer, but you would never know it by looking at the workers. Over the century leading up to this, the British GDP had grown by 50%. But over the same period, worker pay was not just stagnant, but in decline. They were doing almost double the work for less pay. I mean, guys, come on, we fixed that. We fixed that. That's certainly not... Sorry, I mean, as, as productivity has gone up, I mean, certainly wages have improved, right? In the United States of America, I mean, that's... It's just that's we're 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 past it. That's like the eighteen hundreds, the seventeen hundreds. It's totally different time, different time. Things <coughs> things are so much better. You can buy a TV. <coughs> things are so much better. You can buy an iPhone. Shut the fuck up, slave. You fuck yourself. You know you, you can buy an iPhone. You can eat a burger. How can you claim to be oppressed when you can eat a burger? Have you thought about eating a burger? Please eat this burger. Uh, watch football on television. I mean, think about that. Yeah. Exactly. You didn't have that back then. That's why they were complaining. Please stop paying attention to your your wages remaining, uh, your wages continuing to be stagnant while GDP goes up, uh, while uh, productivity skyrockets. Uh, that money's got to go somewhere, and it's going to you know who's going to more productive people. And no, I don't mean laborers. Okay, actually productive people, people that know how to work that money. Okay, you are a fucking simpleton. You are stupid. Know your fucking place. You don't know how to work that money, okay? Some fail son born into a fucking oil family, that motherfucker knows how to work that money, okay? And no matter what you do, do not, do not engage in the act of unionizing. Do not do that because we're a family. We're a family. We're a family. So... Don't do that. That's very bad. You can get a PS5. You can get another TV. You can buy a tasty treat with the union dues. You know? You can do Sigma Grind Set. You can do Sigma Grind Set. Passive income. Passive income is sick. Instead of your union dues, if you were, uh, I don't know, investing in cryptocurrencies, for example, you'd be fucking making so much more money, dog. Oh, my God. No matter what you do, do not unionize. Do not try to claw back some of those profits that you've accumulated for those who will never touch the assembly line or see the fucking factory floor. Do not do that. Let's continue. And the transformation wasn't just in the number of hours worked. Owners and bosses used their leverage to force their workers to live in a tiny authoritarian world. Dude, as stupid as the shit you're saying is, that is the actual sentiment in fact of workers? Yes, because they've been fucking brain broken into into thinking that that is the norm because there is there are very few outlets of information that will tell you what this channel is doing historia civil is what i do on a daily basis and think about the amount of fucking pushback i received for example think about the amount of pushback he received for this video this is an extremely political video, which is unusual for this channel. I watched the channel and for have years to relax and learn about interesting historical events, not be proselytized to. If this becomes a new direction of this channel, I will no longer be a viewer. I was excited to see a new Historia Civilis video, but that excitement turned into disappointment as I realized the inevitable direction it was headed. Motherfuckers get more mad at the messenger than hear out the message, okay? Motherfuckers do not want to live in a world, or rather... They do not want to have the veil be lifted from their eyes, okay? 
That's permanent peasant brain. What that guy is doing is permanent peasant brain. What that guy is doing is going, yes, my lord. My lordship knows. My lordship knows what's best for me. And after all, he told me one day, I too will be a lord myself. It is no longer the divine right of kings, yeah? It's called meritocracy. I work hard day in, day out. I do drop shipping on the side. And one day, I too will be just like me, Lord. I will own capital. It is my fault if I do not succeed. That's what he's doing. Also, I love the I love the the fucking brain cell of this guy who said history is apolitical. Like the implication is that like historical videos are of course famously apolitical. I think what's ironic about this video is that this is as descriptive as you can get. Like what he is doing is just Describing things that happened throughout history. But of course, of course, if you tell the truth about what's going on, people who are terrified of change, who are more comfortable in their servile status, will fucking lash out at you because there's so much discomfort there in the unknown. And especially when it's not just the unknown, but it's actually the scary unknown. Oftentimes, human beings, especially as they get older, obviously fear change. In my opinion, I think that that fear of change comes from uh, not being able to recognize, uh, or, or rather, sorry, recognizing that you're, you're, uh, the end is near, you know what I mean? Life is fleeting. When you see change and you don't understand the world that you grew up in, you're like, oh, fuck, I think I'm going to die soon. What the hell is going on? Uh, I have no control over my life. What the fuck is this shit, right? But then there's also the other side of this where, like, everyone is telling you you don't want this change because the other side is death and destruction. And one of the funniest things that the capital owner does when reinforcing the dogmatic belief of capitalism is saying that under socialism, you will have an accumulation of undemocratic power and control in the hands of the few, which is not only antithetical to socialism, but it's currently what's happening under capitalism. And if there was any kind of anger or any kind of frustration that you feel right now, it's because of exactly what the capital owner is telling you is happening to you. But remember, famines occurred under socialist formations, and they always were the fault of socialism. They were the failures of the systems. But when famine happens under a capitalist formation of the economy, under global capitalism, where we have an abundance of food production, okay? And it's simply a problem of logistics, or rather a willingness to be more moral. Well, then that's, if you're dying, 14 million people a year dying to famine-related disease, well, that's your, that's your L. Where are your bootstraps? That is down... That is up to the individual to survive under that system. After all, this is a bountiful system. I grew up in Naperville. Everything was handed to me in my upper middle class family. How do you die of famine under this system? I guess you simply did not grind hard enough. World run by capitalists. This shift in the culture of work has always been fascinating to me, and so I tried to look back to where it first began. 
When and why did we shift from the more casual and laid back work culture that came out of medieval Europe to the more totalizing and authoritarian and inhuman work culture that came out of the Industrial Revolution? I think I've figured out where things started to shift, and I think I've got it pinned down to the exact year. The top of the hour ad break. That is where those two class distinctions become ever clear. At the top of the hour, there are those who are not subscribed, and there are those who are. And those who are subscribed do not see the three-minute ad at the top of the hour, whereas those who are not subscribed or those who are subscribed do not see the top of the hour ad break. You can change your destiny by subscribing for $5 or for free at the top of the hour or by getting gifted a sub. <sighs> Ajitamush, thank you for the tank of the subs, allowing 10 people to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. Here's a three-minute ad break now. This was a really good video. I'm glad I watched it. 1664. In 1664, some absolutely psychotic capitalist named Richard Palmer, cursed be his name, paid the church in the town of Wokingham, England to ring their bell. Wokingham? Wokingham? They're woking our England, lads! Fucking hell! Wokingham? Oh, stop current day in us! Backing pronouns in Wokingham, England. Don't fucking current day us, Richard Palmer, with your fucking clock and fucking gender. At precisely four o'clock every morning and at precisely eight o'clock every evening. He did this because he was still seeing the cultural evidence of winter wages, where workers woke up later during the slow winter months and worked half as they did. As a capitalist, this drove Palmer crazy. He felt that it was deeply important for workers to be up four hours before sun- Oh my god, Richard Palmer is the original Sigma Grindset guy. Sunrise every day, even if they didn't really have any work to do. If they didn't want to wake up on their own, he would do it for them. So he had the church bell ring at 4 o'clock every morning, four hours before sunrise. Oh my god, he invented the alarm bell. He also felt that it was his job to tell people when to go to bed, so he had the church bell ring at 8 o'clock every evening. Also, shout out to this church for straight up abandoning their religious mission and surrendering to this capitalist weirdo. Way to go guys, I hope the money was worth it. According to Richard Palmer and this new breed of 17th century capitalist coming up with him, private time was an outdated concept. This new generation of capitalists wanted a say in how workers were spending their hours at home. They even wanted a say in what time they went to bed. Bro, that's why it's like the most efficient mode of labor. You will never be able to reach the... the level of productive output is slavery like just like owning a human i know that there it gets there are obviously like uh issues from a capitalist perspective but like that's what it is of course slavery is the authoritarian construct uh is the is the obvious authoritarian one because you, on the one hand, have to pay for the upkeep, yes, as the first bum to die correctly pointed out. And two, you are aware that you are enslaved. Whereas under capitalism, you have the feeling that you are not enslaved because, after all, everyone is telling me that, like, there's class mobility and my boss is there, not because he was born in the right zip code to a better family and was, like, lucky, you know, probability is something you cannot avoid, right? And... And one day I too can be a boss myself. It's, it's, it's a better mechanism of control. Because in that structure, you are not aware that you are a fucking weight slave. You are not aware that there are still forces beyond your control that turn you into this servile being, a cog in a machine. Okay? 
That is the that is the major difference. When you are enslaved, there is a man cracking a whip. And as long as that whip exists, you are aware that you are enslaved. When you are a wage slave, on the other hand, no such direct violence exists in the workplace. And the violence is uh, delegated to the structures, to the systems. The violence is delegated to not being able to pay for food if you don't fucking work. Hyper-individualism is, you know, uh, the, the worst American principle, in my opinion. What the fuck are you even talking about anymore? I, I, I think I'm pretty fucking clear that I'm, I'm describing to you the differences between the immediate authoritarian, uh, uh, the immediate authoritarian construct that exists under uh, slavery, the, which comes with the recognition of being enslaved, versus under neoliberal capitalism, if you're a wage slave... You do not recognize that you are a wage slave. You do not recognize that like there is no other alternative. And once the the whip goes away, you think, well, I have control over my life. I have autonomy. What do you mean? And yet, think about it. 80% of your adult life is spent inside of a workplace where you have no say over what you wear even. You have no say over your life. You have no say over your own free time. And we like to theoretically claim that we like democracy, right? We, theor- we like to claim that democracy is great in the, in the best possible form of, of government governance. Why do, not, why do we not have that inside of private enterprise? Like, if it's the best uh, organizing principle, then why, don't, why the fuck don't we have that in, in the place where we spend most of our adult lives in? I don't know if you care about fake hogs. Government control over lies is not the best alternative. This person is like joking. This person is like making this up, right? Is he being serious? This video is fascinating and well done, but anyone in anthro class, intro anthro class, would be familiar with these concepts about time and leisure. Again, it's the Protestant church. The Catholic church did not endorse this. It's a Protestant concept. I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, he, he's not technically that wrong. Uh, Catholic church... Endorse the humanistic approach to labor. I mean, I don't think the Catholic Church endorsed the humanistic approach to labor across the board. Like, but uh, culturally, uh, yes, there is a cultural difference between the Protestant work ethic versus uh, a, the Catholic understanding. Uh, but you know, I would not sit here and act like Catholicism was uh, a good alternative anyway. A good analogy is how Marx explains that we do not re- recognize the commodity a coat as alienated labor and alienated social relations, we don't recognize our own commodification as wage slaves. I mean, one other, one other example of that is when uh, people look at it, people look at iPhones, leftists even, look at iPhones as like the beacon of capitalism, right? They say, oh, socialist with an iPhone, by the way. It's like, bitch, a worker made that iPhone. The fuck are you talking about? You think Steve Jobs made the iPhone? You think he individually fucking put, uh, put every iPhone together? No. Who, who made the iPhone? Workers did. <laughs> More like our phone. Stop. Anyway. So, remember that. Whenever people say that, whenever people say, <laughs> wow, says you, socialist with an iPhone, they are reinforcing this product as the singular symbol of capitalism and capitalist innovation, a lie, and not necessarily the bounty of collective action across an international cooperation. Now, obviously, there is a way to do that in a more ethical fashion, in my opinion. But as it stands, it's being done in an unethical way, if you are not a capitalist, that is. Anyway, let's continue. They had a totalitarian worldview. As far as they were concerned, all time was company time. Inspired by the work of Richard Palmer, this particular form of abuse became a fashionable trend in England. Psychopaths all across the country started co-opting churches and victimizing towns, all in the name of productivity. 
Why are you teaching us via examples that we can use to defend you rather than general examples? Are you fucking stupid? You think the socialism means no iPhone is an example that is only launched at me? Do you not have an iPhone? How did you type this out? Via fucking carrier pigeon? Dumbass? Is this conditioning? No, it's a simple talking point. Just because it's like foolishly launched against me. How fucking stupid are you that you think I'm like conditioning you to... No, I already fucking ran the top of the air break. Fuck you. Don't try to fucking turn this into a segue. The fuck do you mean? In many instances, I do talk about examples from my life, and I think I, I get a little too ahead of myself, and I think people consider it to be, like, out of touch because, uh, you know, you're, you're not experiencing the same things, but I try to keep it as educational as possible. 20th century Canadian socialist George Woodcock writes of this new breed of capitalist. The new capitalists, in particular, became rabidly time-conscious. Time. Yes, I also say this all the time. Technology is not a trait of capitalism. Not even workers necessarily is an actual instance of human nature. Exponential growth of technology does not happen because we want to endlessly improve profit margins for those at the tippy top of society. It happens out of necessity. It happens out of our willingness to survive and thrive. Not just survive, but thrive. We didn't create hammers and wheels to earn dollar bills. We did it to survive and improve our well-being. Exactly. If that was the case, we would have never had any technology that predates the Industrial Revolution. Time, here symbolizing the labor of workers, was regarded by them almost as if it were the chief raw material of industry. But this newfound obsession with time and productivity didn't stop there. When this new generation of capitalists left their places of business, they would see their workers getting off work for the day. And what did they see them doing? Standing around in groups, chatting, relaxing on public benches, walking into public houses to grab a meal or God help us a drink. All of this public recreation bothered Palmer and his friends immensely. Palmer's obsession with the clock coincided almost exactly with the rise of English newspapers. And what did this first generation of newspapers like to discuss? They liked to discuss the problem of the poor and specific- <laughs> Nobody- NOBODY WANTS TO WORK ANYMORE! FUCKING HELL! Specifically, the problem of the leisure activities of the poor. The capitalists were very open about this. They said that the only legitimate leisure activities for the poor were mental cultivation or religious study. Basically, studying Latin or studying the Bible. That's what poor people should be allowed to do for fun. Anything other than that, they argued, was corrosive to the culture. For those keeping track at home, bribing the church and turning it into a private tool for the capitalist class, not corrosive to the culture. Relaxing on a public bench after work, corrosive to the culture. These people were demons. That's what the capitalists wanted. No life outside of work. No hobbies. No <laughs> and conservatives haven't come up with a new talking point since. I mean, they love recycling and conserving talking points. That's it. That's the only thing that those motherfuckers love conserving and recycling. No idleness. No relaxation. No days off. Nothing to look forward to. No life. Just work. <laughs> Holy shit. Capitalism fucking rules. Let's give bosses more. Exactly, dude. That's how I feel, too. You watch this video, and, and you're, you, you are more cognizant of your class position, and you start getting depressed. Me, on the other hand, I'm like, fucking hell yeah. Dude, I would sell my firstborn to Elon Musk, okay? He would know what to do with my firstborn better than I ever could. After all, he's the God King, dude. I fucking love that. But hey, listen. Listen, dude. Listen. 
that fucking dumbass who likes to wear designer clothes on fucking twitch.tv, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, by the way, that guy, he doesn't, he's not telling you the truth. Don't believe him. Don't believe him, dude. That guy fucking sucks, dude. He's got a house. It's a nice one. He's got a car. That's a nice one, too. When he tells you you deserve more, you deserve fair wages that you have participated in creating, that guy's fucking cringe, dog. Pfft, I hate that guy. He's fucking stupid. He's a grifter. He's a real big grifter, big one. He's just making money by telling you these things that I despise and many others despise that doesn't sound a lot like, uh, you know, that that's, is the exact opposite of what I can hear from every other fucking outlet. But he's grifting. He's grifting. He's just found his own fucking avenue. Anyway, let's continue. And someone else's profit. Even after three years subbed, I still have to check myself sometimes when I feel resentful that you're rich. <laughs> Bro, how do you think I got here? <laughs> you gave me the money. <laughs> like, what do you mean? It's like, I fucking hate this guy, dude. Fucking hate. I fucking hate him, dude. It was a piece of shit. <laughs> 20th century Canadian socialist George Woodcock concedes that mechanical time is valuable as a means of coordination of activities. Yeah, I regret that. Can I get that back? Like, think about that. That dude has been in here for three years, okay? Three years. He gave me $180 over the course of three years, like, which I didn't even ask for. Like, he was like, no, I want to fucking support this. Like, I like this, okay? $180 over the course of three years. How many hours? Have you spent in here? <laughs> it's like, yeah, obviously, if you fucking, uh, if you look at that and you, uh, you know, calculate that by 40,000, 50,000, yeah, it fucking adds up. You know what I mean? It's pure, it's pure math at that point. I mean, I, I don't, I get it. Like, I don't fault you. For feeling that way. I'm just saying that that's how it works. We did this math. I forget how many years ago. We did this math a couple years back. That showed that if you subscribe for $5 a month. Okay. Uh, it came down to. Two cents an hour. I think it was two years ago. If you watched every fucking hour of the broadcast from start to bottom, from start to finish, you were paying two cents for every hour of the broadcast that you consumed individually. Now, back then, I had streamed 42% of the year. And for the record, I don't even get the full $5 for the subscription, obviously. But it doesn't matter. I'm saying, like, and plenty of people subscribe with Twitch Prime. Some people also give subs. I mean, I don't know what to do. Like, there's nothing I can do about it. I can... I can lie. And be like, man, your shit is so fucked up, guys. I mean, my situation is terrible. Or, I don't know, I can not lie. But, anyway... Um, I want to do that again. I want to do that calculation now. I wonder, considering how many time, how many hours I streamed last year, I would, I would wonder what it would break down to. Chatter's talking about Hassan, like League Addicts talking about League of Legends. Yeah. Don't pay attention to negative fucks. No, that guy wasn't even being negative. He was just being honest. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Even back when um, I, I like just simply out of sheer laziness and out of comfort drove a fucking Camry, people would make fun of me and say, oh my God, he's trying to LARP as a poor person. And it's like, I wasn't, I was just too lazy to get a fucking new car. 
And these motherfuckers were saying that. Like, they still were saying that. So there's no winning in that situation. Haters are going to hate no matter what. Um, Just going by your contract at 180 hours a month, that works at two, uh, $2.77 per hour if you watch all of it. Yeah, but I don't do... In 2022, you streamed 2,495 hours. There you go. 2,495 hours is how many hours I streamed last year. Okay? 5 times 12. That is if you're paying, it's 60. What was it? Two. What was the number? I forgot. 2495 is about two and a half cents. Damn, I've improved 2.4 cents. Before it was two cents on, on the dot. Now it's 2.4. Inflation, baby. That's what I call inflation, motherfucker. That's right. Enjoy getting fucking grifted. That's Bidenomics, bitch. That's Bidenflation. Sorry. Before, if you wanted to consume every fucking uh, part of this content, you'd get it for two cents an hour. Now, 2.4 cents. Of course, there's also the other stuff that I make a big part of the reason why my hours are uh, lower is because I also have two podcasts. So that definitely plays a role in it, but you know, yeah. in a highly developed society, just as the machine is valuable as a means. What is this? Respectfully, if you as a rich person buy modest middle-class items, you would just be taking it away from someone who's likely actually middle-class. Please buy more Porsche. So Camry families, if Camry's available, I mean, it doesn't, I don't, I don't think I can offset someone like that. Let's be real. Of reducing unnecessary labor. But, he argued, the modern use of the mechanical clock did not reduce unnecessary labor. It did the opposite. Her Thank you, Femboy Agiprop, for the 50 get the subs. Meals. The regular morning and evening scramble for trains or buses. The strain of having to work to time schedules. All contribute to digestive and nervous disorders. To ruin health and shorten life. What to make of all this? We are richer as a society than ever before. But somehow we are less free. Workers have lost so much, not just our afternoon naps and our holidays, but our autonomy, our dignity. In short, we work too much. This guy's typical but it lazy, dude. He's a YouTuber. Fuck it, does he know about working hard? You know what I mean? I, on the other hand, do work hard at the racism factory every day. And, you know, I, I don't think I deserve more money. I don't want a siesta. Okay. Yeah. Fuck you, dude. Don't tell me. Like, I'm I suspect. I suspect looking back, like the the average worker guy who does not want to see the truth of his circumstances will react to this video and go, Why are you fucking telling me this? I don't want to think about it. This is supposed to be my entertainment. This is supposed to make me feel more intelligent about the world. Maybe I can repeat it to like some lady so that she'll say, oh my God, my boyfriend also thinks about the Roman Empire all the time. Look at how fucking deep he is, right? And now I got out of work after a long fucking day of getting shellacked by my goddamn managers who were representing the interests of my fucking bosses that I'll never meet, okay? Because they're sipping my ties somewhere else. And now, you told me that my workplace conditions have worsened over years, 
and years, I don't want to know that. I don't want to see that. I don't want to feel that. Now, instead of getting angry at the systems that you have uh, uh, perfectly described with historical framework, I will get mad at you for telling me this. Okay? I will get mad at you instead for being the messenger. I will shoot the messenger. Fuck you. Doesn't have to be this way. Medi it's ironic that Chash is telling you to do this video and you're contractually obligated to stream X hours and also have to run ads on a clock. No, the, the clock method is my own to keep myself uh, on board. Like, I just have a, I have a density, like an ad per hour density, but I'm the one who chooses to run it at the top of the hour. And also in the middle of the hour, the one minute hidden ad. Huh. Evil French peasants took as much time off as they could afford, which for them was 49% of the year. It's time for us to start moving back in that direction. We already know how to do this. We have the money. We have the policies. We have the administrative capacity. We have